I was thinking when when you were coming to join us for for a conversation, this is going to be so meta. We're going to have an interview about interviewing. I'm going yeah. to ask you questions about asking questions. And, right. And uh, I'll tell I'll tell you whether you're doing a good job or not. <laughs> yeah. The, exactly. the, the whole way we go. <clears throat> when when people see the interviewee giving commentary on uh, the course and the flow of the interview and scoring uh, the interviewer along the way, it's just going to be too too meta to be uh, comprehended. Yeah, yeah I, th I think I'll intersperse every now and then. I think, Kevin, what you really want to be asking is, and I'll, I'll just keep I'll just keep shoehorning that into the conversation. <laughs> well, the other thing I thought is I should have a, a bell on my desk for every time I nab something straight from your book, which is a which is an unabashed steal, and um, and I can just say a little homage that yeah. I'm uh, I'm trying to hoist you on your own petard. <laughs> well, I'm 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 sure I stole it from somebody else, so we're probably quoting <laughs> many generations back. Good, good. So um, look, I'm not I'm not going to give a, a great deal of intro here. Folks are who listen to the authors that um, that we interview tend to just look them up themselves and, and the biography material is quite good. So let's save, let's save a couple of minutes and dig. Yeah. In. And, and, book, book and, and actually, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I cut you off. No, I'd, I want to hear what you had to say. Well, all I, I was going to say, everything you'd want to know probably about my background, you can get on my website at deannelson.net. Okay, super. Well, and, and at the end, we'll, we'll do a redirect. So, so people <clears> know to, to catch you there. Okay. Um, the book is called Talk to Me. Here's something funny. If somebody didn't know the title of the book and didn't know Professor Dean Nelson and wanted to find a book about interviewing, they would be thrown into a very big ocean of books about interviewing to get jobs. So when you Google how to interview, interview technique, etc., it is a needle in a haystack to find a book like yours. The shame of that is, in my view, that it's it may be among the core five foundational skills for anybody who sells, anybody who leads, anybody who pitches. Uh, so you know, raises funds, um, pitches ideas. Um, maybe anybody who's in uh, counseling. So it is just such a skeleton key of a skill set and yet so tricky to find. So that's that uh, that Dean, I think is just my my way of saying we were really excited that we found your book in the first place. Well, um, I want to know how you found it. If it if it was that difficult to find, how did you do it? Um, we stumbled upon it the way that, you know, if you're going running and you're not, you, there's no half a glance down at the street, you could easily just spike your toe off a, off a boulder or a, right. <laughs> or a curb. And, uh, and what, a, what a delightful thing to have spiked our toe off of. Um, Talk to me is a compelling title, and I think it's a good title. Can, you, can we launch in at that point and just say why, besides the obvious maybe cosmetic appeal. Why, why did you call it Talk To Me? Well, I just think there are, as, as you in your introduction uh, were describing, pretty much any aspect of, uh, of our interaction in a society depends on how good of, uh, of, of, the, of an interaction that actually uh, uh, entails. So what, when I was first uh, writing this book, I was thinking more very journalism specific for for that kind of an audience. And the editor at Harper Collins was actually very astute. I thought she said, "No, nah, broaden this out. Uh, think about think about social workers. Think about lawyers. Think about podcasters. Um, these are people who talk to others." And uh, and the more I thought about it, I just thought, wow, she's absolutely right. I have to confess, Kevin, I did not think about financial analysts. I was not thinking in the financial world when I was uh, when I was writing this. And I'm so glad you were able to find uh, the book and find some application for it. But I, I agree with you. It's just fundamental to how we uh, how we interact with one another. It could be 
my kids. It could be, uh, you, you know, I, something as basic as uh, you ask your kids how their day went at school, and you're either going to get one, a one syllable answer, mm. uh, or you're going to get some engagement. And that's not on them. That's on you. Uh, you've got to ask them a, a better question. So uh, I just think the title "Talk to Me" is um, is fun and uh, it's casual, uh, and it's it's just a it's just a way to to make it to just normalize it and take out the formality. That's that's kind of how I viewed it. Yeah. There's a section where you make this lovely comparison between sword fighting and fencing. And uh, maybe I'm reading too deep into just a title, but I feel like it's it, it's code for spar with me or or fence with me, or there's something a little playful that actually right. runs a through line around, look, let's just, let's have a go, like come, Come on out onto the, I don't know what you call the fencing uh, court or the floor or the yeah, the, yeah. field of play for fencing, but come out there, um, stick on, you know, grab an FP and stick on a face mask and um, do this with me. Now, I think that's, a, I think that's a very astute observation on your part. It is a little bit playful, but it, it, it but here's, and here's why I think the sword fighting and fencing analogy uh, is significant. And I'm so, I'm so glad you brought it up. When you're sword fighting, uh, the object is to win. And when you're in a dialogue, when you're in a discussion, the, 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 the point of that discussion is not to win, is, is not, I mean, at least I don't think it is. There are some people who, who feel like uh, that's, that's their role in life. Um, but, but fencing is your it's it's this then it's that then it's this and then you're you're improvising and then you're you're retreating a little bit and then you're advancing and i i just think that describes a good interview um but there are some who whose whose whole goal in life is to dominate to win whatever i think about your world you're not you're not trying to win an argument when you're talking to uh, clients, uh, companies, potential investors, you're not you're not trying to win anything. You're yeah. trying to extract some information and 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 get to know that person as a human being and and kind of do some assessing of of them. And you do that by fencing. You don't do that by whacking them with your sword. Yeah, <laughs> if, if you kill them <laughs> metaphorically. Yeah, um, yeah. The, come back. What, what have you What have you won exactly when you do that? <laughs> I've got to find a new fencing partner. <laughs> exactly. Fought the last it, one. It, yeah, you you might poke them a little bit, and I'm okay with that. I'm okay with scoring points every now and then if I'm a journalist uh, and I'm trying to get at some information. And I, I think again, I think about your world. If you if you feel like you need to probe a little more deeply into maybe the narrative that you're getting, and you think there may be more to it, I think it's okay to go ahead and 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 probe a little. Mm -hmm. More to it, uh, I'd say that's that's maybe something you understand which I and our listenership, our readership, wouldn't have the depth of experience about what that means. There's more to it. I mean, I, I think everyone will immediately say, oh, there's a, I have a sneaking suspicion there's more here. But in your experience and the way that you teach this, Dean, what do you do when that moment bubbles up sort of at the gut level or or may or maybe or maybe starts to tingle up here yeah or here. yeah you, you get that spidey sense uh uh a, a little bit well i i do think uh you don't have to turn it into an interrogation but i do think you have to uh keep keep 
digging a little bit. And you do that with open-ended questions. And I also do it, uh, and, and this may sound you know, like I'm acting, but I'm really not. But I, I just say to the person that I'm talking to, wait a second, I don't understand. I, I thought it was this way. And you're saying it's that way. And so what what am I missing here? And uh and 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 reveal that you know you you came in thinking it was it was this was kind of how how it all went down. And um and then they can either confirm or deflect or or whatever. But um but I really do think this the spirit in which you bring those open-ended questions and that probing um, really matters so that you're not putting the person on the defensive. Because uh, that's, again, what, what have you gained when you do that? Well, maybe let me challenge you on that. If, if the spirit, if that spirit creates defensiveness, why do we find in some of the best known most established, most experienced journalists, notoriously exactly that they put people on the defensive for all to see. Some of that is, uh, as Mike Wallace uh, used to say, some of that is heat for heat's sake, just because it's it's kind of entertaining to uh, to see the the subject of your scrutiny uh, squirm a little bit. Um, I personally don't take a lot of joy in that. I th I think there are some who that's that's their thing. I I think heat for light's sake is a different proposition. So if you're if you're kind of boring into uh, a topic or an issue or a person's account of things um, because it isn't squaring exactly with with uh, perhaps what you believe or what you know to be true, I think that's okay because you're still trying to get the light of the the matter out there. If you're doing it just to show you can be a bully or just to uh, to be kind of an audience getter, that's that's fine for some. That's that's not my jam. Yeah. When you watch those folks, are you do you ad admire them and just say, "Look, they have a slightly different martial art than I do," or that do you think no, question, that's a disruption uh, of the of the craft? Yeah, no, that's that's a really good question. So if if there's if there's someone who I maybe don't like very much, uh, t take an Alex Jones for instance, who you know claims that uh, the Sandy Hook. Uh, elementary school killings didn't happen. Um, and I see Megan Kelly uh, put him on the spot, or I see uh, a Jonathan Swan from Axios put uh, former President Trump on the spot and, and really, really try to keep them on the topic and confront them with some of the, uh, some of the things they've said that have been simply not true. Um, I, yeah, I confess, Kevin, I probably enjoy it. I probably yeah. enjoy it because, uh, because I'm, I'm seeing somebody hold somebody accountable and, uh, and they, I'm, I'm okay with that. What do you, what do you see in your students? There's, there's some, there's some bemoaning and bewailing the state of journalism. And, um, you're actually seeing, I, I believe, um, wave after wave of new graduates matriculate from studying it to, I would presume, doing it. Yeah, they are. Patterns there. Is there is there anything that is happening in that world we don't know? You know, it's a, I, I I love that question because it 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 goes. Uh, what I see today is a little different from what I saw maybe ten years ago, uh, or even um, just even about six years ago. Um, I think there is a tendency. I'm going to make a huge generalization here, which That's will be good. totally unfair. So, so I'm 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 just putting it out there that I gonna, I know gonna, that what I, I know what my, I'm doing. I'm going to ring my like error buzzer <laughs> if this is too big. 
that I there are a considerable number of college students today who are very uncomfortable with confrontation. Uh, I think there have been other generations of students who are totally okay with confrontation. I was raised uh, in a journalism context where uh, the adversarial relationship between journalism and authority was not only okay, but it was expected. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, there is a... Uh, there is a view, at least I'll, I'll speak for American uh, college students, where I, th I think a lot of American college students uh, are taught to be compliant. And I, f I find that a little disturbing because uh, I, I think it's our responsibility to be skeptics. And so, um, I have had to emphasize skepticism more in recent years than I've had to in other years. And, and, and let, me, let me make sure I, I explain what I mean by skepticism. Uh, skepticism, well, let me, let me counter it against cynicism, because I think those two things get used interchangeably and they're completely different words. Here, here's, here's how I view cynicism cynicism uh the cynics are people whose default position is i already know i already know and they they aren't open to something maybe new or something that might be counterintuitive or might challenge their their thinking so uh cynics have already decided and uh, skeptics say, instead of saying, I know, skeptics, in my opinion, say, I wonder. And then that leads them into a search. Mm -hmm. So here, here's another way to look at it. Cynics, in my view, make statements, which the root of the word statement is they're in a state. Mm -hmm. Skeptics ask questions, and the root of questions is they're on a quest. Mm -hmm. Cynics are the most boring people in the world to be around because they already know. They already know. Skeptics are the most interesting people to be around because they want to know, mm -hmm. and they, they they're they're willing to do the work to find out. So, what I this is a long way to answer your question. But I do spend more time today uh, with college students on skepticism uh, than I felt like I had to in uh, maybe in previous decades. Mm -hmm. Are they graduating and going into journalism or are they graduating and going elsewhere? Many of them are going into journalism. Um, where I live in San Diego, California, every news operation organization has our uh, alums working there um, as, as well as uh, places all around the world. But here's, here's one of the reasons why I still love teaching journalism, even as the job market for traditional journalism uh, may be shrinking, well, is shrinking, not maybe shrinking, is shrinking. The skills you learn in, uh, in journalism education apply virtually everywhere. Our, our journalism students do extremely well in law school because it's all the right. same skills. It's, yes. it's research, uh, it's, uh, it's writing, it's writing a, comp a compelling narrative for a specific audience. I mean, it, and, and then marketing. Marketing is still storytelling. And so you're still bringing in information. You're still trying to hone a particular narrative for a particular audience. Mm -hmm. um, I can't think of an aspect of society that that doesn't need skillful storytellers. And so uh, a journalism education uh, gives you that. Yeah. 
Well, uh, I'll sort of declare my my bias, which I've done with you already, but I'll sort of do it for an audience more broadly. The ability to ask questions and to think in a planned and deliberate way at first, and then in an extemporaneous and fencing way, uh, live in the moment, is is not sufficient, but it's absolutely necessary, non-negotiable necessary, if you want to do serious business development. So any I, serious high-level job where you're trying to broker deals of high value, for example, you have to you have to master this craft. And you have to usually start early if you want to get to mastery. So I think the stakes are very high, actually. I, I feel like it should be part of the um, liberal arts education that every school that's willing to take that that structural path, I feel like it should be a prerequisite before you graduate. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a, a really interesting point. And of course, it would be great for my book sales if that became sort of uh, standard for uh, for all universities. But yeah. uh, but seriously, the the point you're making here of um, of engaging people at a at a at a in a more deliberate, intentional way. I mean, that's 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 absolutely crucial. So so when I think about um, interviewing and and students, I, I had a student say to me one time, um, "Should I incorporate more humor?" into my interviews the way you do would i would i get better at it you know and and i'm thinking no no be you got to be authentically you mm. but you do have to develop uh and hone this as a craft this is not something you're either born with or not born with it's you know i think it's like playing a musical instrument you the more you do it uh and the and the more you practice, um, I think the better you're going to get at it. But it this is not, it's not all instinct, and it's not all genetics. I just think the longer I've done this, the better I get at it. And um, so I, it it's something I agree with you. I would love to have it kind of as a fundamental uh, aspect of of education, but. What I don't want people who might be listening to this uh, to think, well, I'm shy, I'm an introvert, I I won't be very good at interviewing. I totally disagree. I think yeah. some some <laughs> of the shyest people, some of the most introverted people, are fantastic interviewers. I bet. Yeah. Well, that that certainly is is something true in um, corporate sales, uh, and I actually mean that word dean um in the areas where you wouldn't expect it like who who's who at a law firm is in sales the answer is nobody um except for everybody who's yeah i was gonna say the post. it's everybody yeah it, well it's everybody to senior post who has some, and 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 the introverts are deadly assassins there it's like i quietly do my work when it's time to meet with you i ask you a handful of questions because i care and look i come away with a sophisticated matter to handle for you yeah, and and those questions that those shy introverted people are preparing are usually just million dollar questions. They're if if they're prepared, if they've if they've done their homework, they don't have to come in guns blazing. They just have to ask a couple of uh, really well thought out, well prepared uh, inquiries, and everybody knows. Oh, this person's. This person's to be taken seriously. I'll, I'll give you an example about sales that uh, I think I have in my in the Talk to Me book. Um, I was writing a different book when several years ago when um, and everybody was out of my house. My kids were in school. My wife is at work, and this was a writing day. And I'm just kind of in the zone. And somebody knocks on my front door, and. Uh, and I usually, you know, it's usually tr somebody trying to sell me solar panels or something like that. And uh, and I just ignore it. So whoever is knocking at the door, ringing the doorbell, I forget it. I'm, I'm working. But there was something about this particular knock that I just, I thought about it. And then I got up and I went to the door. 
And here's this kid, I don't know, he might be 10 or 11. And he was, he was awkward and he was awkwardly dressed. Uh, and his, his, his basketball shorts were way too high on his torso and every, everything about him just looked awkward. And, you know, I just kind of looked at him for a second and he adjusts his glasses and then he goes, uh, I'm going to try to sell you something. There was something about his authenticity that absolutely took me in. And, and I immediately reached for my wallet. I, I, I thought, I don't care what he's, it could be magazines, it could be candy, it could be methamphetamines for all I, all I knew. It, whatever he was selling, <laughs> I, was gonna, I was gonna buy it be, because he was so raw and authentic and true. And it turned out to be candy, you know, which I gave away. It, but but there was something about that. And I, the lesson there, Kevin, is you don't you don't have to pretend. You don't have to play act. You don't have to think you're uh, channeling, you know, some uh, some great uh, interviewer. Just oh my gosh, just be yourself and be prepared. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to uh, if if you're game to go with me. You talk about this um, metaphor, and I want to I want to take it as far as we might the grammar of a meeting, and oh um, yeah yeah yeah, the, in particular the use of silence. But um, can can you get going on this, and and uh, I'll I'll chime in where I get most excited. But what do you mean by the grammar of a meeting? Well, the grammar of a sentence is is how is it structured? Uh, what's 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 the focus of it? Where's the action, and where you know where is the object and the uh, the subject? Where is all of this headed? Uh, that's the grammar of a sentence. Silence carries those same uh, functions, uh, in my view. And the example I've given a couple of examples, I think, in the in the talk to me book about somebody who was just really, really nervous uh, to talk with uh, both me and a reporter from the Los Angeles Times uh, about a an investigation. He was leaking information to us, but he was he was also just very, very, very scared. And the. And the LA Times guy picked up on this right away and just sat across from him and just it did like this. And then he just exhaled really loudly. And when it was clear, nobody was going to start firing questions, which I think would have spooked this guy even further. And then he would have just, he would have locked up and and that I think it would have lasted about five minutes. But just that silence gave him permission to collect his thoughts. And uh, then he just started drawing us a picture of, uh, of the thing that, that he said was, was going wrong. It was a picture of a bomb actually. And uh, that, was, that was not performing as it should be uh, for the US military. And, um, and he just started drawing a picture and explaining it. Nobody asked any questions. And honestly, Kevin, it was one of the best interviews I've ever seen because nothing was forced. Uh, every we both the other reporter and I both were able to assess this guy's personality and nervousness and anxiety and just let him start talking. And then after a while, then we you know, then we could engage a little bit and ask a little more and, uh, and, and get a little more detail. But, um, but I, but I also think it reveals a lot about a person's personality. If, if, if they're silent, I, I think we, as interviewers or just as human beings, we're nervous about silence. And so, uh, you know, we say dumb stuff to one another, you get in an elevator and you just say, you just say something dumb. <laughs> and uh, and why why is that? Because we're uncomfortable with silence. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying that silence is actually really, really useful. 
Uh, and when somebody is ready to speak, uh, if you have the time, it, do, it doesn't work very well on television, but if, if you have the time, just let it lay there. I'll, I'll give you another example. We had uh, the writer, very provocative writer and speaker, Cornell West, at our uh, writer's symposium just this past February. And I asked him about his mom who had just passed away. And I knew that was potentially, you know, too sensitive, too personal. And he just kind of leaned back and thought for a minute. And my instinct was to then rush in and say, well, you don't have to talk about that if you don't want. It. But I just, I just let that lay there for a little while. And then he felt comfortable enough and safe enough to start talking about his mom. And uh, that's, that's what I mean. We think words and action and activities are what's needed when sometimes we just need to let, we just need to let something percolate and uh, let it just rise. Law lawyers maybe don't have that luxury because they're billing people every seven minutes. And so, uh, so you know, are you going to bill them for silence? I don't know. But interviewers, what you do, what I do, I think silence is actually an ally. So if we've got silences in the grammar, let's talk about Let's talk about the the capital letter first first word first combination of words that kick a sentence off now still as a metaphor. Um, what's been what is what have you learned about the way to start? I think that's that's a real challenge in in all these in all these arenas that we're speaking about, knowing how to start the grammar is a, cha a challenge. So how do you start? Yeah, I, I don't think you can say all interviews should start this way. All conversations should start this way. I think you have to kind of read the room and uh, uh, get a sense of the comfort of, of, of this person. Uh, it, it, when, when I interview writers for the Writers Symposium, what I try to do is spend much of the day with that person before the interview begins. So they've got a comfort level. Uh, they know I'm not I'm not out there to get them. You, you for what you do and what lawyers do and financial analysts, social workers, they don't have that luxury. But I'm just telling you, oftentimes, why this works so well. Because then they're then they're comfortable. There there isn't that sort of get to know you uh, kind of thing. Um, but if I'm working on a story where I'm uh, interviewing somebody from the police department or the border patrol or or something like that, um, I might start uh, by trying to find something in common. Uh, that could be a picture drawn by a child. Uh, that's hanging on the wall, picture of a dragon or something like that, and just say, "Hey, who's into dragons in you, in your house?" And you know, uh, but you only want to do that for um, a couple of minutes. But what you're what you're doing there, Kevin, is you're establishing some shared humanity. Mm -hmm. You're trying to you're trying to break out of I am in this role and you are in that role, and then we. Um, we just stay in those roles and um and we and i don't know does anything useful actually get said then i i think if you can establish some shared humanity um that would be maybe the first thing out and so that isn't necessarily the first question but it may be more of a comment and an engagement about a a trophy or a picture of a big fish they caught or, you know, something. Um, that is part of the grammar as well, because you're, you're kind of in that throat clearing uh, uh, kind of aspect uh, of the conversation. And then, then you can move into, okay, we're, we're two human beings here. 
Now let's just talk about this thing that we've come here to talk about. We've made a bit of a study of small talk because it's so important in a, in a boardroom context and, and now on a Zoom call context. And I think that it's <clears throat> what you just shared is it's remarkable how intuitive that is for a lot of folks. <clears throat> the, the seeking of something in common. Right. So without knowing that, they're immediately trying to find what was your alma mater and like, do you yeah. live in the West or the East or something? And I think uh, my feeling is that that's what that's what is happening. There's another. Yeah, no, no, you you can take that too far though. You you can take that too far. I I had a a, a guy who I was interviewing. It was a CEO of a company, and uh, I went to his home. And I was, and I, we just started talking and we got to, I knew where that he was from a particular state in the U S the same state where my wife was from. And so, you know, I start going down that road. Oh yeah. My wife's from such and such. And we got about five minutes into that and he cuts me off and he says, we've proved it's a small world. Now, can we get on with the interview? And I thought, <laughs> okay, Great. Great. all right. No more wasting this guy's time. <laughs> well, that, that gave you, I guess, some useful information in terms of how to continue. <laughs> That's exactly right. I was all business from then on. <laughs> um, let's talk about a little bit of uh, some, some question structure. So one of the things that I will just encourage people to do, it's not a big book, so they should just read the whole thing. Um, but if they decide to, to do a skim is pull out the question structures because therein lies this amazing little kit of tools um, that any any self-respecting woodworker would go holy cow that's a useful one oh i could do something with that etc etc um so if you'll indulge me dean maybe we can just kind of bang a few off as uh, sure. as, as as dean's as dean's list there's a there's a um there's a question structure that I think of as like a would you rather or an either or. It forces, rather than asking the question, it forces them to choose between alternatives. Um, where did you, where do you see that in play? How do you use it? Can you describe it? Yeah, if I'm if I'm trying to get at how a person maybe came to this career or uh, or or found this uh, made this discovery or um, or came to this conclusion. Um, what what I what I like to do is ask a question in such a way where they can either confirm it and then expand on it, or or they bat that first question away and say, no, it isn't anything like that. And then now they're obligated to, to tell you what it actually is like. And so so one of the ways you can do it is, is say, so when you started this, were you thinking such and such? And then, you know, it's just a hypothetical. And then they're either going to say, well, yeah, because, and then they, they go on and give you something more. I mean, on the one hand, it's a yes, no question, but but you're really, they know, you're inviting them into um, expanding that a little more. So if you say, what is this what you were thinking? Was Did you think it was going to go this way? Then they say, no, that isn't what I thought at all. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, uh, somebody asked me recently, did you always want to be a journalist? I mean, was this the, did you think this is where you were headed from the very beginning? I said, no, I was a pre-med major in college. And, you know, I worked on ambulance crews. I worked in emergency rooms. And then that launches me into something completely different for that, for that interaction, for that exchange, than what's it like being a journalist? Yeah. You see, yes. those are two completely different structures. Yes. That will get, one of those is going to get you really rolling. And the other is going to go, uh, it's it's fun. Next question. So so one of the challenges that business people will feel in their exchanges and and when they are in a seat where they need to interview is that they want to know they want to know whether problems exist and the nature of those problems. And I fear that uh, 
they don't have the question structure. So often, often they have they have a fully legitimate curiosity and an authentic um, posture and a desire to know. And it isn't a purely selfish desire to know. They do want to see what's you know what's there and whether there's service to be done. Um, but they end up with the second version of the, of the question that you said. They say things like, "What's your pain point?" or something e equally, yeah. you know, um, lame, uh, and and that doesn't go anywhere. So maybe actually, there's a. I, I just thought there's maybe a different structure, being a, a sub a sub branch. These are maybe uh, a subspecies on sure. the genus on the genus tree. <laughs> Which is sort of correct me if I'm wrong. That's awesome. I'm putting forward this, you know, I'm putting forward this this proposition for how things may be. Um, okay, so it's not either or. It's just what what you know. I sense that it's this, uh, yeah, which is yeah, the structure I, that I just heard heard you use. Right. So um, and and that I believe you discuss in the book as well. This kind of I don't know. How do you characterize that that type of query? Yeah, I, I, I there's I characterize it as the as you as you mentioned earlier on uh, the game of would you rather? You know, is, is it more like this? Is it more like that? Uh, if I were if I were just this observer coming in, I'd say, well, this is what it looks like, and and so you're giving them all sorts of options you're giving the other person all sorts of options to either explain refute uh expand deny uh correct all of those things mm. if you just kind of give them some stuff to either latch onto or bat away you know mm. uh you know, one of the things I th I think I mentioned in the uh, uh, in the book all is one of the worst questions you can ask, but everybody asks it is the what's it like or what is it wh how did it feel? You know, you just won the Stanley Cup. How does it feel? Uh, you, you you just you just won the World Cup. How does it feel? Uh, my gosh, what what could you possibly get for an answer in something like that? So you got to just be a little more creative. When you were when you were a kid, pretending you were winning, you got the winning goal in the World Cup. Uh, did you you know did you learn a happy dance when you did it? What how how did you prepare for a moment like this or 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 something like that where you're you're trying to draw that person out? For a business perspective, as as you're you're saying, really the. The key to that will be is how prepared are you going into uh, into yes. that conversation. So if you've really done your homework on that company, you're going to have a whole bunch of things that where you can say, you know, it kind of seems like it's this, or it seems like it's that, or I would have thought you would have gone this way instead of that way. And um, but you're only going to do that if you've if you already know a lot about that uh, organization or about that person before you go in. That is a very uh, observant point. So there's something there's something very shameful actually about a question like what is your pain point because you can cut and paste that to every single meeting you go to and everybody knows that. At, at a, and, and they're all lying. And anybody who tells you they know what their pain point is, they're just lying. Yes, yes, yes. Whereas, whereas you absolutely can't cut and paste something like, I know that seven of your middle managers have left. So is it causing you panic? Yeah. How many more of those can you afford meeting, to lose? Everybody knows that. So, so it, it comes across as uh, this, as you said, this deadly combination of I've done my research and um, I, I'm seeking for light, right? Yeah. I'm not deep. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, other question types. What What are some other structures that that you love that have served you and the and your students well? Well, I just think any question that begins with why or how is going to get you much better uh, responses than when or what. 
-hmm. and uh it, because those are open-ended questions they're uh they're they're ones that that take more than a a a, a one word answer or a yes no um uh and and i keep going back to uh the the example of my of my dad in world war ii you know he, he was stationed in the Arctic Circle uh, doing weather reports so that Allied bombers would know what the weather was going to be on the continent, you know, a couple of days uh, uh, in the future. So I, I, I witnessed this and I just thought, are you kidding me? So a group from the Smithsonian Institution comes out to his apartment. And uh, they want, they're doing this whole series called Witness to War. And they're talking about these war vets because, you know, they're all in their 90s and uh, there aren't very many left. And so they want to get these, this kind of oral history. And the first question the guy asks after they've set up the video camera and the lights and everything is, what was it like being on the Arctic Circle? <laughs> that's the opening gambit <laughs> that was his opening question yeah <laughs> that i i think on the video you can hear me slapping my forehead in the background because i'm thinking oh my gosh you're talking to a 91 year old guy about something that happened a long long time ago and you're saying what was it like it, it isn't like anything guy grew up in the south side of chicago what was it like yeah, it wasn't like anything. So how about you think about that differently instead of so you just have to do a little do a little thinking about this. Um, how cold did it get? Uh, what did you do for uh, for food? Uh, were you in contact with anybody uh, back in the U.S.? How often did you get mail? Why were you in the Arctic Circle? Uh, you know, I. I can come up with a, a dozen questions in 30 mm -hmm. seconds that are better than what was it like. And so thinking through what is going to get you an open-ended uh, discussion or conversation, mm -hmm. that's where you wanna be a, a, as far as structuring a question. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you, but it, here's the problem, if you make it so vague, like what was it like when it's not like anything yeah uh then you you just watch an old man lock up yeah or give you some uh one word answer like brutal or cold yeah exactly <laughs> that that doesn't tell me anything <laughs> yeah yeah and kills kills the flow of the grammar right it, it's it a, does it's a terrible first sentence and now now everybody sort of co-creating and reading that grammar has to go oh, let's yeah. start over yeah yeah it's only going to get worse you just know it yeah <laughs> yes so how do you prepare when you when you know there is a single easter egg that you're really hunting for which i think is actually the case in a lot of um in a lot of interview dialogue there's one thing in particular that would be the the best little treasure to find and yet you know meetings have their natural duration so, some of them shorter some of them a little longer um how do you organize around that dean when you, when you know look this is probably the question that's going to get there but I know it can't be the very last thing that I ask, and it also can't be the very first thing. So where does exactly. it go? Without being too formulaic about it, uh, yeah. I put it I put it about two thirds of the way in. Okay, and it, for this reason, you've got the you've got the opening kind of get to know you shared humanity section. So where where they're you know we're trusting one another, you hope anyway. And then you get some informational kind of stuff and you get some background and they're they're becoming more and more at ease and uh and trusting. And then about two thirds of the way in, that's when you that's when you unearth uh what what whatever it is you're you're really going after. Um and the reason I say about two thirds in, because it may end there. 
your interview may just end right there. That may be so that may put off your uh, your source so much or your client or whatever so much that that they're uncomfortable with that. And then they just say, you know, I, I think we're done here. But at least you've gotten two thirds of some pretty good stuff. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to make it the last thing either, uh, because the last thing you want that, at least in my view, you want that to be kind of a cool down uh, kind of time where now we're returning to it's just it's just a uh, kind of thing or saying you go back through your notes or your recording your transcript and say you know you said this i want to make sure i understand this you you want to make sure you've got enough time to do that at the end of the interview right um and and so that's that's where i'm strategic i'm not when i'm doing interviews let's say with a uh, a police officer or a border patrol officer i'm not looking for an easter egg i'm re i'm what i'm doing is i'm asking a question that i know readers and viewers are going to want to know mm -hmm. and and it's and it's going to be kind of a thorny thing that's why i'm saying uh it, the the interview may end there i asked a a question about a um about a shooting down at the San Diego uh, Tijuana border several years ago. And the border patrol officer was so upset by my question that that was the end of the interview. But I still had all this good stuff leading up to it. Mm -hmm. So what, what you're talking about is unearthing something or really kind of getting to the heart of something. Um, being strategic about where you place that inquiry um, that's where I would put it. It's about two thirds. Mm -hmm. And do you still do that even if even if the what I call the Easter egg there, I guess, is is not the kind of thing that's at risk of <clears throat> making people walk away or taking umbrage or something. Uh, uh, you know, where it just doesn't have that quality uh, as as an answer, but it still might be the great point of value. It might be the point of value, but but if you don't want that particular thing to dominate the entire conversation, that's why I'm thinking strategically. You could ask that question. It could be an awesome question at the very beginning, but you want so much more than just that piece of it. Mm -hmm. um, that's why I'm thinking even, even if it's not a gotcha kind of thing um, um, or a confrontational kind of thing, if you've got some other information you want to make sure you've got also, uh, I would do that first. And then you can, you, you get the Easter egg and uh, then you can just let that roll a little bit. Uh, and here's, here's the other thing that that could do is that could get you going into a, a whole nother level of discussion. And let's say you've asked for 20 minutes uh, with this person and and at maybe minute 15 you ask it or maybe minute 12 you ask this question and they really get excited about it at 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 20 minutes and they're still rolling you can say hey I know I asked for 20 minutes and I want to respect your time but this is really interesting can can we just keep going for a little while mm. I've done that and the answer is almost always yes Interesting. One of the conventions in business is for the, say the, the interviewed party, the interviewee, um, to declare, I have a hard stop at, right at the outset, uh, buy the, but they buy themselves an insurance policy just in case this loser across from them decides to steal more time than, <laughs> they, than they're allowed. So, so you, you see that commonly. Oh, Oh, by the way, Dean, uh, it's good to see you. I know you're coming to pedal your words, whatever. Uh, I've got a hard stop at, at uh, 930. So just letting you know. And that's their insurance policy. So that when it comes and if they tend to get into just a barn burner of a conversation and things are going good and they're interested, the hard stops evaporate in the in the light of the sun. It's amazing. <laughs> I've seen that happen a thousand times. Yeah. Uh, and And really, though, out of respect for that person, even then, Kevin, what I do is I say, I, hey, it's 930. I, I know you said you needed to go at 930. 
I I've got time. I can still talk about this, but I also want to respect uh, your time. And um, so I, I think that's uh, something that's just a, a courtesy rather than just let them roll. Uh, remind them that that you're being mindful of uh, of, of of their constraints as well. Um, I want to make a totally lateral jump if if you're if you're fine with that and, and talk about something quite mechanical, which is note taking. <clears throat> yeah. Um, uh, what do you what do you recommend for folks who are not journalists but are interviewing? They're doing the cra a craft that looks in the field identical in many ways. Um, what do you recommend by way of note taking? Uh, there are a couple of things, uh, and and uh, I mean your your phone is a uh, it, it has it typically has really good uh, recording uh, uh, function on it. I personally use a smaller recording device that um, that that has a uh, a microphone that detaches, and you can just set it across the desk in front of that person, and it's just a little digital. You know, it's the size of a a little it's a little bigger than a flash drive i'm trying to had i thought had i anticipated this kevin i would have had it in front of me but uh i've got it someplace else but um but i i if it's a uh if i'm talking to a the president of something or um uh, or somebody who i think uh it could be an adversarial kind of deal and say i never said that or whatever i will record those interviews but um here's the thing this is just really, really practical stuff. Um, you you also have to take notes. Uh, so recording it, just having your phone recording it or having your recording device recording it, you're only half the way there. Mm -hmm. Here's why. At some point, that machine is going to crap out that the battery is going to die uh, and something is going to happen. And I think it's in, it's a, a dir in direct proportion to the importance of the interview. <laughs> the, tech as, can, as, the tech can feel the gravitas of the fellow. Across exactly, the exactly. It just rises in its importance. <laughs> and there's something that happens in the atmosphere that just kills your machine. This is why you also have to take notes. And, um, now, what I do also is I make sure I've got my digital recorder uh, next to me so that while I'm taking notes, if, they, if, if you say something really provocative or evocative or something I know I'm going to want to come back to, I'll look at uh, my digital display and see what the timestamp is. Mm -hmm. And then I'll, I'll just write that in the margin. Come mm -hmm. back to minute 512. And uh, and I'm going to get something really good there. But the thing about note taking is um, nobody writes down every word. I write. I typically write uh, nouns and verbs. So when somebody is saying something, I'm just trying to get the um, the main thing that they're saying, mm -hmm. and then uh, and here's. Here's just another little practical thing. Every now and then I'll toss in a throwaway question that I don't care about so that I can fill in on my notes. And it looks like I'm taking notes on that answer and I'm really not. I'm just filling in on something else that they've just said. But, uh, but the other thing about uh, like a digital recorder this sounds wasteful and you leave a carbon footprint, but I think every time you do an interview, you got to put in new batteries. I, you, you might just think, oh no, I'm sure, I'm sure there's another hour left in these. I'm, I'm just saying there isn't, there isn't. And, uh, and so uh, always put in new batteries, always push the, push the timestamp back to zero. Uh, always take notes along with um with what you've got uh with with the recording and then you can uh then you can compare then when you get out to your car to the elevator or whatever then you look at your notes and then you can fill in your short-term memory is really pretty good 
you fill in all those gaps from when you were just taking sentence fragments. Uh, then you can fill those in and then you get back to your office and you transcribe them. Um, there are some good talk to text uh, programs, but they're not perfect. That's mm -hmm. why you have to, uh, that's why you have to double check those. There, uh, I, I will share with you that they're uniquely terrible in Southeast Asia. Are they really? Like, like for example, I, I live on a street called Jalan Lada Pute. What do you, what do you think otter is going to do with the, with those three words? I mean, it's just going to turn it into a train wreck of guesses. Yeah, Jello is going to be in there somewhere. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's going to start with Jello for sure. Um, Dean, the the second to last question that that I need to ask you, and I'll just tell the the, the last one is is going to be where do you want people to find you? Um, cool. So okay. Make sure we do some wayfinding. But okay. um, the, but the second to last one is uh, what's your what is your favorite unimportant thing to do, sir? What a great question. What a great question. You you were trained well, my friend. Uh, Straight out of the manuscript. <laughs> no, you know, no, but it's, it's nice to it's nice to um it's nice to press you with that question because I would like to know. Well, and it reveals something, you know, outside of the professional kind of journalism uh interviewing kind of world. And so it 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 rounds out a person's uh, humanity a little bit. Uh the, if if you were to call it unimportant, uh, I don't think it's unimportant. But uh, okay. in in maybe the uh, um, in a societal way, if you look at my career and stuff as a journalist or a professor, or whatever, it's not important that I play ice hockey every week, but I do. I was raised in Minnesota, which is a suburb of Canada, and I have played hockey my entire life. I still play it in Southern California, and uh, and it's my favorite. It's my favorite thing to do outside of you know playing with my kids or grandkids or or whatever. It's not important in uh, in maybe a societal kind of way, but it's very important physically. I would say even spiritually because I get all of my aggression out uh, mm -hmm. on Saturday nights. Whatever has pent up uh, gets gets left on the ice. Okay, so we got we've got a goon. We got a goon here. <laughs> no, I am not a goon. I promise you. If you saw me, you would never think the word goon. Uh, uh, super, Dean. Um, this the, the what you've written and what you have to share is good enough that we could do a series on this. But let's um, let's just say we've slaked the thirst a little with this conversation. And it was uh, great and fun. Thank you, thank you Dean. And uh, I'm I'm going to tell you, just uh, interviewer to interviewer, you did a good job. You asked good questions. Thank you, thank you, thank you, sir. I appreciate it. So, so you want to know where to find me? If you go to yes, deannelson.net, deannelson.net, d-e-a-n-n-e-l-s-o-n.net. Don't do .com or .org. You'll you'll find some some guy who who works on cars. Right. Uh, uh, so go to deannelson.net. There's a bio thing. You've got all the interviews that I've ever done with uh, with writers, stuff I've done for the New York Times, stuff I've done for the Boston Globe. That's all on there. Superb. Well, thanks again. We'll be in touch. Uh, we'll be in touch very soon. Have a great yeah, it was evening. fun talking to you, Kevin. Good job. Bye.